In New Orleans, gumbo is not merely a dish. It is a declaration of the city's vibrant soul. It is a lifeblood of the place, a profound symbol of community and continuity. Infused with the spices of diverse peoples and simmered in a history as vast and enduring as the Mississippi River itself, gumbo melds the flavors and tales of a city at a crossroads. As we journey together through this episode, you are invited to traverse the vibrant streets and narratives of New Orleans. Here, each spoonful is steeped in the essence of the city's people and their rich past. Sit down with me at the tables where the gumbo simmers hot, the stories resonate deeply, and the spirit of New Orleans pulses vividly. This narrative offers more than just a mere taste of local fare. It extends an invitation to delve into the very heart of the city itself. But that isn't everything. When we finish this story, I'll show you how to make a root. To make a proper Cajun gumbo is a labor, yes. A labor of love, driven by the heart of the root. Hello, I'm Eddie Parker. In New Orleans, at the heart of the Great River, the Canal Street Algiers Ferry crosses with the steadiness known since 1827. It starts at the foot of Canal, next to the aquarium, a fitting place to begin. For $2, you can leave the rush of the city behind you. You can sit back and watch the city spread out from the water like some fine, sprawling map. Every 30 minutes, the ferry moves. It's a clockwork thing in a place where time often seems to sway, like the jazz that fills the air. From six in the morning till half past eight at night, and later on the weekends, to the hour nears eleven, it runs. People board and leave, some for work, some for the quiet of Algiers Point. Algiers waits with its old homes and quiet streets. It's not just a place of history. It is where the pot boils with gumbo, thick with ochre and filet, dark with root, rich with the sea or the land, speaking in tongues of French and African and Indian. The gumbo is never just one thing, it is many. It is debated over tomatoes, over the color of the root. It is as alive as the city itself. So the ferry in its simple passage is a thread through the fabric of New Orleans. It is at the heart of the city's pulse and part of its history. It carries its people to and from work, to and from the past, and always, always to the table where the gumbo waits, rich with everything that has ever come to Louisiana's shores. On the banks of the Mississippi, in Algiers Point, there's a place called the Dry Dock Cafe. It's old New Orleans, sitting right there, greeting those off the ferry with the smell of seafood, the kind that speaks to your bones. It's more than a cafe, it's a piece of the city's heart, tucked into the second oldest ward. As you walk in, it's like stepping through time, the walls covered in things from the sea, and bits of the past, set a scene, but it's the food that grabs you. Gumbo thick with what the rivers offer. Poor boys spilling over with taste. Burgers that fill you up and stick with you. The drinks too, the kind locals not at, rounding off each bite just right. But Dry Dock, it's been there since 1901. It's not just about what's on the plate. It's the stories, the ones that weave into the fabric of this place. Every person who walks through the door, they're stepping into a story that's been told since before their grandfolks were born. It turns visitors into folks who keep coming back. I walked into the restaurant on a quiet Wednesday afternoon. The place had just opened for the day. At first, the room was empty, silent except for the sounds of my own footsteps. Then people began to fill in, quick and without ceremony. 
They talked as if they had fought wars together, their voices warm and familiar. The bartender smiled as he took my order. Soon a bowl of seafood gumbo came, steaming. The scent of it was honest and promising. It was filled with shrimp and sausage, bound together by a root dark as the river mud, and just as deep. Each bite was like a novel by Faulkner, simple and profoundly crafted. I ate slowly. The gumbo was good. It filled me. I was already planning to come back as I scooped the last of it from the bowl. At first taste, the bread pudding brings you back to an old kitchen, back at your parents' house when you were small. The dish is a marvel of indulgence, rich beyond the ordinary bounds. Its base, a dense custard, soft and full of a deep sweetness that thrills your mouth at every bite. In the rush of life, the dry dock stands as a reminder. There's joy and there's community right there at a table in Algiers Point. In New Orleans, Charles Pee Wee Armstrong is well known. His is a name tied to an expanding empire of seafood that captures the essence of the city's varied palate. He started simply enough, delivering meals of fresh savories to folks directly and running a pop-up in a CBD bar that grew popular quickly. As his reputation for quality and inventiveness grew, so too did his operations. Shops for takeout sprang up in Central City and New Orleans East, becoming essential spots for those seeking standout seafood. But it was here in Gentilly that Pee Wee made his lasting mark. Pee Wee's Crab Cakes, once a counter service joint, turned into a center for those who love the ocean's bounty. Here, not only his famed crab cakes, but also platters of assorted seafood and Creole dishes bring in people from all corners of the city. The seafood gumbo I ordered was packed with meaty crab legs, plump shrimp, and hearty slices of sausage. This gumbo was a rich tapestry of flavors that defined the region's food culture. Every ingredient melded perfectly with the next, creating a robust, cohesive dish. Impressively, the gumbo was seasoned to perfection, carrying just the right level of heat to allow the natural flavors to shine without the need for any additional Tabasco or seasoning. But what truly set this dish apart was its remarkable affordability. In a city known for both its opulence and its poverty, it's rare to find a dish that bridges the gap, offering a luxury dining experience at a price that welcomes everyone. This accessibility invites diners from all walks of life to partake in the distinctive taste of New Orleans without the worry of a hefty bill. Each spoonful of this gumbo didn't just satisfy the palate. It connected those who taste it to the rich, lively spirit of New Orleans, making it not only a culinary delight, but a cultural expression. For anyone seeking to understand and appreciate what makes New Orleans cuisine so uniquely captivating, this gumbo is a must try. I knew I couldn't step into Pee Wee's without sampling their renowned crab cakes. So I opted for the Crab Cake Poor Boy, a decision I wouldn't regret. Presented in the Poor Boy Loaf were six golf ball sized fritters, each a generous orb of delicately fried seafood perfection. Cutting into one revealed an inviting mixture brimming with fresh crab meat, finely chopped onions, and bell pepper, all bound together with just enough breadcrumbs to maintain integrity without overshadowing the crab's natural flavor. Upon tasting, the crab cakes were perfectly seasoned with a delightful spice balance that accentuated rather than masked the sweet crab meat. Each bite was delicious on its own, yet when paired with the accompanied sauce, a zesty concoction spiked with just the right amount of hot sauce, it transformed the meal. At Pee Wee's Crab Cakes, the atmosphere buzzed, service was swift, and the menu broad. All of it together spoke plainly of why Pee Wee's name and his food 
are vital to the spirited culinary scene of New Orleans. Pierre Antoine sits on the corner of Royal and St. Anne in the old heart of New Orleans. It's been there since 95. You can sit outside and watch the French Quarter go by. They serve food all day. Breakfast, then lunch, then dinner. The portions are always big. They cook Louisiana style, the kind with crawfish and oysters. When I walked in, the service was quick. They knew their business. I was at a table fast and my order was taken. Then right away, there was gumbo, hot and steaming. It looked good. They served it up nice with a dark roux that said it tasted as deep as it looked. The first spoonful proved it. It had the right kind of bold. No need for too much spice, but just enough room to add some if you wanted. I put in a bit of Louisiana hot sauce the kind the Texas Rangers baseball team swears by. The shrimp were pink and tender, cooked just so. There were tomatoes in there too. That's not unusual. It's not what they do in the bayou, but I liked it. It worked. Made each spoonful good till the last. The whole thing, quick service, the look of it, the taste, made it a meal to remember. The prices are good. They get their stuff local making sure it's fresh. That way, every dish tastes right, like it should here. They keep up with what folks like to eat. People come back because the food's good and the folks are nice. It's part of New Orleans. At the corner of Felicity and Turk Sipkeri in Uptown New Orleans, there is a place called Herdat Kitchen. It's a good place. Jeff Hurd runs it. He is from New Orleans and knows it as well as anyone. For more than 30 years, he has worked with the best and now his kitchen shows it. It's a simple place, but it does things right. Jeff's gumbo is what people come for. It has shrimp, chicken, and sausage. It has spices too, the kind that don't shout too loud and make you think of places you've been or want to go. He serves it with potato salad and a grilled cheese sandwich. It's a good meal. You eat it and you know you've had something delicious. He learned to cook from his family and from watching good chefs. He makes the roux the right way. It takes time. It's how he does everything. His place isn't fancy, but it's right. He's open Monday through Saturday and people talk about his food. They show pictures on their phones and tell their friends. That's how you know it's good. Jeff and his team look after you. They are professional. It's not just about the food. It's so much more than that. It's about making sure you leave better than you came in. That's what Jeff does. That's who Jeff is. If you're in New Orleans and you want to eat, you go to Her Dad Kitchen. It's a place where the food is part of the city and the city is part of the food. Jeff Hurd is there, cooking. It's a good place to be. Little Dizzy's Cafe offers a warm welcome that embodies New Orleans spirit, situated at the city's vibrant heart. Rooted in the Baquette family's rich culinary tradition, the cafe serves dishes steeped in history, like their famed 60-euro gumbo recipe. Managed by Akisha Baquette and chef John Cannon IV, Little Dizzy's maintains high quality by focusing on key ingredients and traditions. Open for lunch six days a week, the cafe is celebrated for its gumbo and legendary fried chicken making it a vital part of New Orleans dining and cultural scene. The place fills before it opens, the line stretching back from the door along the street. People stand, talking softly, shuffling their feet. They know the routine. At the opening, she stands at the front, sharp and quick, her voice cutting clear through the morning air. She hands out menus, 
sorts the line with a few brisk words. Orders are taken, paid for before the counter is even reached. Money changes hands quickly, a practice dance. Tables are assigned, numbers call, mills appear, each one right, just as ordered. Landing on the table with quite efficiency. The room buzzes, a satisfying hum. The gumbo was full, rich with tassels, sausage, shrimp, and rice. Every bite spiced just right. No hot sauce needed. The stock was the real thing, homemade in the heart of it all. To call the gumbo good would be too little. It was more than that. It was superior. The service was sharp and sure. Everyone got exactly what they came for. Yet the place felt like eating at the table of a well-loved neighbor. Warm and ever welcome. The Canal Street Algiers Ferry moves steadily back and forth as the kitchens of New Orleans bubble with gumbo. The city is not just people and places, it is a living mosaic, colored with history and culture, each part a story of survival and taste. From the deep roots of Algiers Point to the counters of beloved kitchens, New Orleans pulses with tradition and the spirit of community. The ferry, like the gumbo, it's more than its function. It is a passage through the heart of New Orleans, a clasp to the rich and storied past. It connects the pieces of a city spread out like a map, linking lives and history, simmering in every pot of root. At last, the true essence of New Orleans shows in the steam from a bowl of gumbo. It reflects the city's skill and weaving its varied heritage into something whole and flavorful. It is a place where every corner offers a taste, each taste a story. Here, at the meeting of the river and the sea, old and new, all are invited to the table. The gumbo is hot, the stories are full, and the spirit of New Orleans is shared, one spoonful at a time. Down in the bayou country where gumbo is king, the rue reigns supreme. It's a solemn art, the browning of this mix, fat melted with flour, worked until it turns the color of the deep earth. There's a truth held in the kitchens down in Cajun land that a good gumbo rue takes as long as drinking two beers, no less. It's about the clock, it's about that color, that rich, dark hue akin to aged chocolate, a sign of a root done right, essential to both Cajun and Creole hands, as sacred as the holy trinity of onion, celery, and bell pepper. But mind this, the darker the root, the more it sings of flavor, it trades its thickening power with each shade it deepens. Here, patience is not just a virtue, but a necessity, for in the making of a gumbo, as in life, the best outcomes often come to those who wait. These are the tools you will need to make a good roux your very first time out. First, you will need a pot that can stand up to the task. An enameled cast iron Dutch oven is always best. It holds the heat steady and true. Use the same pot for the roux you will for the gumbo. It saves wasting and the flavors build one upon the other. It's the practical way, the way of simplicity and strength. For this task, a proper stirring tool is essential. Begin your roux with a whisk to chase away any lumps of flour. Then switch to an old trusty wooden spoon. It should feel right in your hand, strong enough to scrape the bottom of the pot thoroughly as you stir. Always avoid using anything plastic to stir your roux. The roux runs hot and plastic can melt, spoiling the mix. Stick with that old wooden spoon. It's reliable and enduring. A roux has only two ingredients. It starts with a simple measurement, one cup of flour to one cup of oil. As the roux cooks, it transforms, the flour undergoing what they call the Maillard reaction. This is no simple browning, but a chemical ballet where sugars and proteins in the flour deepen, darken, 
turn rich and nutty in their taste. Remember, as you cook the roux longer, its power to thicken wanes. Each moment on the fire changes it, lessens it in a way, enriches it in another. Step one, whisk. Whisk the flour and oil together over medium high heat, making sure there are no lumps. Work it until it is smooth. For a white roux, it takes just two or three minutes. It's potent for thickening, best used for soups, stews, or gravy. Its flavor is mild, unassuming, but effective. After five minutes, turn the heat down to medium low and keep stirring. Now's the time to switch to the wooden spoon. In another five minutes, you'll see the roux turn blonde. This blonde roux, taking perhaps five to 10 minutes, still thickens well, but begins to have a hint at a nutty flavor. It's the sort you use for a bechamel, perfect for creamy pasta sauces. Keep stirring, never stop. Scrape the sides and bottom as you go. After about 25 minutes, you should be looking at a brown roux. This stage, they call it the peanut butter roux because of its lighter brown shade, like the heart of a good jar of peanut butter. It sings with a deep nutty flavor, but holds back some of its thickening power. Here, you stop if you're making a etouffee or a stew. It's just right for that. After 30 to 45 minutes of constant stirring, your roux should deepen to the color of dark chocolate. This is what you use for your gumbo, a dark brown roux. Taking up to an hour, offers the richest flavor, ideal for gumbo, though it thickens the least. Be watchful as the roux darkens the color changes quicker, a moment too long and it can burn, turning bitter, so be careful. Keep a steady hand and a keen eye. This is no task for the hurried or the distracted. Here are some expert tips for making a roux for a gumbo. Don't burn it. This is the cardinal rule of making a roux. A burnt roux turns bitter, speckled with black, like a bad night without stars. Once burnt, there's no salvaging it. You must begin again. There's no glory in a ruined roux, only the promise of starting fresh. The best defense against a burnt roux is to stir. Then stir some more and do not stop. Do not walk away, not even for a bathroom break. Make sure to scrape down the sides and bottom of the pot evenly. It's the constant attention, the unwavering hand that keeps the roux from the char and ruin of neglect. When you're new to the art of the roux, keep the heat low. You might be tempted to turn it up, to hurry the process alone, but don't, especially if you're new to this. High heat is a quick path to burn, raising the odds of burning your roux. Patience is your ally here, slow and steady, like the movement of time itself. Be gentle, be careful. Hot roux is like lava, it will burn. Stir it gently to keep it from leaping out of the pot onto your skin. Chef Paul Prudhom called it Cajun napalm for a reason. When cooking roux, especially over the hottest fires, wear long sleeves. It's about respect, the kind you give to something powerful enough to hurt you. Don't break it. Roux can break, the fat and flour parting ways into a greasy chaos, and nobody wants that. This happens when temperatures shift too swiftly, so never ever toss cold ingredients like the Cajun Holy Trinity or chicken broth into a hot roux. Such sudden changes are akin to abrupt weather at sea. Best avoided to keep your course true and steady. Slowly add your liquid ingredients a few cups at a time. Stir them in and check the thickness of the roux. Remember, the longer a roux cooks, the less it thickens. Pouring all your stock in at once will leave you with a thin soup, not a thick gumbo. Go slow. You can always introduce more fluids gradually to adjust the thickness to your liking. Like navigating a river, it's about reading the currents and adjusting your approach. So cheers to you and yours. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I would like to personally thank everyone who has subscribed to Gulf Coastal Connections. You make all of this possible. And if you haven't subscribed yet, Please do. We can't do this without you. If you haven't seen our episodes on the Carnival Valor's voyage to Cozumel 
and Progreso, Mexico, go see them now. I will leave links in the description. New Orleans Best Jambalaya airs Tuesday, May 7th. Be there. This is Eddie Parker thanking you once again for watching us on Gulf Coastal Connections.